The only Ku Klux I ever bumped into was a passel of young Baltimore doctors trying to catch me one night and take me to de medicine college to pyramid on me. I see dem a laying for me, and I run back into de house. Day had a plaster all ready for to slap on my move. Yes, sir. Cornelius Garner, ex-slave, Virginia. Interview by Emmy Wilson and Claude W. Anderson, May 18, 1937. Weevils in the Wheat, 1976-102. My arrival in Durham comes on a sweltering August afternoon in 1937. I am here on work with the Federal Writers Project, tasked to conduct interviews of former slaves, to collect their stories, memories, and folkways, as that generation is daily dying out and will soon reach its end. Securing lodgings comes with its usual difficulties, as Jim Crowism is as rampant in this city as any other in the South. From experience, I can assure that if there is anything a Southerner dislikes more than a colored man, it is one who shows education and learning. The proprietor of the local Chanford Motel informs me that he does not rent rooms to niggers with further invectives, followed by a hail of saliva and pungent chewing tobacco. I wipe the detritus from my spectacles and leave the establishment, not altogether surprised. After some investigation, I am able to secure lodgings in the city at the place of a colored butcher, a squat anvil of a man with arms suited to his profession. He tends to his work while we haggle, hacking at a knuckle of meat with a wide hog splitter and cleanly slicing flesh from bone with a thin knife. Well, I'll take you on. Mr. Bissett, is it? Gonna have to get your food someplace else though. Mama else is just round the corner. One of the finest meals you'll ever have in town. Less you like your meat rare. He chuckles, wiping his apron with ham-fisted, bloody smears before showing me up some side stairs. The room is clean but spartan. A small bed, a closet, and a window that opens to an alley. You can comes and goes as you please. Gonna have to put up with the smell though, when I'm butchering. I surreptitiously sniff the air, where a coppery scent seeps into every pore and crevice. You say you a writer. His eyes move to appraise my supple hands. And you here to ask old folk about slavery times. Government pay colored men for that. I explain that many of the old Negroes prove reluctant with white interviewers. The Works Progress Administration hopes that colored men and women, such as myself, can alleviate their recalcitrance. He laughs. President Roosevelt making a job for everybody. And what you thinkin' to find out about slavery times? That white folk had as much of the devil in him than as now. We share a knowing smile before he departs, the one that unites the colored race across region and cast in our sacred knowledge and unwritten scriptures on the ways of white folk. When he's gone, I open my suitcases, laying out my clothes and removing a leather book that I placed beneath the mattress. Then I set out for dinner. True to the butcher's words, Mama Elsa, a matronly woman who is a wonder in the kitchen, provides me with a fine meal of the Southern Negro variety. Learning I am from the North, she sits to talk with me over jars of iced tea and raisin cake, suggesting where I might find older Negroes who remember slavery. When I return to my room, I plot out my plans for the next day, turn down the lights, and retire. I wake up sometime after 2 am. I pick out a white suit from my belongings, a full jacket, vest, and pants with white socks and white shoes. Fully dressed, I grab up a matching cloth bag and make my way down the side passage of the butchery until I step outside. Pulling a white bowler down to keep it firm, I enter into Durham's still night, keeping from the main roads and remaining hidden behind buildings and shadows until reaching my destination. When I rap on the door with a white gloved hand, the face of the man that greets me looks confused perhaps from being roused from sleep, or at the sight of a tall Negro man dressed in white, wearing a surgeon's mask. The blur of silver cuts a clean line across the man's throat, spraying bits of crimson onto the white apron I assiduously placed over my wares. He clutches the open wound, shock and pain marring his sharp features. He does not try to scream, not that he can, with the severed trachea. 
Instead, he tries to hold in the fluid that leaks over his hands, staggering back and knocking over a small stool as he falls. I follow and close the door behind me. The proprietor of the Chanford Motel lies on a disheveled rug, his bare legs kicking from beneath a blue robe. Riding the stool, I seat myself and watch. The condescension that had once filled those gray eyes, when he'd earlier hurled slurs in my face, is gone. There is only fear now, in a gaze that is fixed singly on me as if I have become his whole world. It is an animal's terror, unable to look away from the predator that has captured it. He watches as I remove a cloth bundle from my bag, spreading it upon the floor. The silver instruments within are sharp, made for cutting and slicing. I run a finger over them and am reminded how similar a surgeon's tools are to a butcher's. A wet gurgling comes from the specimen laid out before me. A failed attempt to speak through ruined cartilage. I imagine it is asking why. So I answer. You may think this is vengeance for our earlier uncivil encounter, but I can assure it is nothing so base. I draw out my leather book, opening it to show notations and sketches. I'm a curious man, you see, looking for something. And you, I believe, offer a fine sampling. Those panic-stricken animal eyes remain on me as I cut open the specimen's abdomen. They stay open long after I begin my search within the reek of bile and organs. In my book, I jot down my findings. My first three interviews, the next day, yield little result. Two of the Negroes were children at the end of slavery and remember little of it. A third is so addle-minded, he does little more than glare. It is late afternoon when I arrive at the home of Miss Maddie Shaw, who lives with her granddaughter in a humble shack at the city's edge, near woods untouched by electricity, plumbing, or paved roads. Miss Shaw claims to be 97 years of age. She is an ideal illustration of the old Negro type. Black skin, white teeth, and woolly hair. Her face, with its wide forehead and prognathous jaw, bears a regal countenance that looks descended from the Amazons of Dahomey. She is bound to this place by infirmity and lords over it like a kentake of old marrow. When I tell her why I've come, she is guarded. Can I tell her about slavery days? Show, but I ain't going to. Most of it I can't remember. And the rest's too awful to tell. Don't need to know all that old talk know how. You got sweeties? I lack sweet things and don't get dim too often. At learning I have no sweets, she turns away from me with disinterest. Her granddaughter, younger than myself, though aged unnaturally by a life under Jim Crowism, is my savior. She prods the elder, telling her I've come to put her story into a book. Miss Maddie Shaw shifts in her rickety throne and eyes me contemplatively. Well, I'll tell your son to put down in your book, but not the worse. Where I'm from, was born and raised right here, same as my mammy and pappy, back when dis was all pain land. My old missus, dat be Miss Emma Payne. How she treat me? Lack a missus treat all her slaves. She'd slap and beat you with her hands, and every now and din take to you with a switch till you raw. But her husband was the tough one. Hang you up by the thumbs in the barn and den whoop you till the blood run. Did he beat women? Why sure he beat dem, just lack men. Beat us naked and washed us down in brine on Sundays, right for he gone to church. She makes a bitter face. I ain't gone tell her much more. No, I ain't. No sense for you to know about all those mean white folk. D all day now. Is day in heaven. Lord, no. Day don't deserve heaven nor hell. Wish the night doctors had took him. Those last words jolt my spine. Setting aside my writing pad, I reach into my bag for my leather book and bid her to continue, trying to hold back my eagerness. Night doctors. Oh, day was a fright round here back in when dis was pain land. Night doctors was men. You see, only day was not men. Used to come round at night and snatch away slaves to spearmint on. Best you up and die for the night doctors get you. Day take you to where day stay, a great white dissectin' hall, big as a whole city, and cut you open right there and show you all your insides. Old Miss Shaw reads my face 
as if it were etched with runes, and grins at deciphering them. Oh, I sees what you lack. Ain't stories about slaves and white folk you want to hear. It's stories about haints and witches, raw head and bloody bones. Old Maddie knows dem stories and better. You come back with something sweet, might just tell you more. With that, her face closes. I shut my book in turn and bid her farewell, thoughts of night doctors whispering in my head. Night doctors. Mama Elsa squints at me over the frosted rim of a mason jar. Now what you want with them old stories? I explain that the Federal Writers Project is interested in the folkways of ex-slaves, and I share a particular interest. In fact, I tell her, I am collecting such stories for a book. She raises a sculpted eyebrow and removes a flat tin flask from somewhere in her voluminous saffron dress to top off our iced tea. You writer folk show got queer ideas. I just know what the old people say. Night doctors was supposed to be men what snatched away slaves. They'd leave traps to get you. Some of them had black bottles full of ether or needles to prick you with. Other times, they put plaster around your face. They'd experiment on you. Slice you up while you was still alive even. I ask if she believes such stories. Did when I was little. My auntie used to tell us. Said she heard them from our grandmammy. Used to give me a fright. But I knows better now. Night doctors was made up by white folks. Was the masters they selves. You see, dressing up and scaring the slaves to keep them from running off the plantations. I nod thoughtfully. Night doctors, night witches, night riders, bottle men, and needlemen. My first hearing of the tale was back in Washington, D.C., in medical school, conveyed to us as a curious superstition of Negro migrants so plentiful in the city. Much as Mama Elsa relates, it's commonly held that the folklore arose with slave masters. Others claim it began with the all-too-common practice of selling deceased slaves to medical colleges as cadavers. Night doctors lingered on with freedom, with some mistaking the clan for Ku Klux doctors. The stories are common among Negroes throughout the cities of the South, Charleston, New Orleans, Birmingham. And though told with slight variations, they share a remarkable continuity. Suppose you asking about these night doctors because of what's been happening here in Durham, Mama Elsa says. I work my face into befuddlement, and she leans forward to whisper. It's all folk can talk about. Four white people found dead in the past week. They was cut open and then sewed up, like somebody took the insides out and put it all back in again. I round my eyes to match her alarm, asking if they've caught anyone. She shakes her head. They ain't know who done it, but they saying it got to be some kind of doctor. They check in all the white folk work up at the hospital. I sip from my jar. Of course, in Durham, the culprit would be expected to be white. Negroes were suspected well enough of delinquencies, stealing, robbery, rape, even casual murder. But nothing like this. Nothing that required such skill. Had anyone cared to look, they would find a pattern to the specimens. The story owner who viciously beat a colored boy of twelve for the offense of not removing his hat in a white man's presence. The public defender that conspired to shuffle his clients into chain gangs. The old carpenter who bragged openly of the Negro he once helped burn alive. The thread that connected them was gleaned from the whispered chatter picked up in spaces like Mama Elsa's of the many sins of this city, like the others. It should have been easy to see, but was rendered as invisible as the crimes each had committed. Them killings done started up talk about night doctors, Mama Elsa went on, some saying they even seen a man in white skulking round the back streets at night. I remind her that she doesn't believe in such things anymore. She returns a wry grin. There's what you don't believe in, Mr. Bissett, and then there's what you're afraid of. She pauses. We used to sing this song about night doctors when we were small. She puts on the wide eyes and hoary voice of an ancient storyteller, mesmerizing her clansmen about the fire. You see that house? That great white house? Way yonder down the street, they used to take dead folks in there, wrapped in a long white sheet, and sometimes when a nigger did stop, they wondering who was dead, them night doctors would come along, and bat him on the head, and drag the poor dead nigger chili, right in the dissect and all, to investigate his liver, lights, his gizzard and his gall, take off that nigger's hands and feet, 
his eyes, his head, anal. And when them doctors finish up, there wasn't nothing left at all. She finishes with a whoop of laughter. Maybe you can write a book about that. Perhaps I will, I answer, and I sip my tea. It is a week before I return to see Miss Maddie Shaw. I find her alone, her granddaughter having gone into Durham to do domestic work. I ask if she remembers me. Well, show I do. See you come back to ask more questions for your book. Colored folk show come up high in the world. You get to learn from books in all dim big schools with the white folk. No, a school just for colored folk. Well, ain't that something? What day learn you dar? Medicine, I tell her, discarding my earlier pretenses. I learned how to be a surgeon, but I was a curious man and I now search for something beyond what my learning could teach me. I tell her I think she might be able to help. She listens and shrugs. If so you say, you brung something sweet. I offer up a bag of caramels, and her old eyes light up. She takes one between thumb and forefinger, plopping it in her mouth and sucking joyfully. I wait for her to finish and ask about the night doctors. Like I say, day was men that was not men who snatched away the slaves. They come mostly for the sick and old ones. Did Marcer Payne know? Pshaw. White folk ain't pay no mind what slaves say. They lose a healthy nigger and they thinkin' he ran off. They lose a sick or old nigger, just one less mouth at the tro. Did they like to scare us? Show. Nothing made them happier than scaring niggers, except in whipping em. When I was small, Master Payne used to put out a tro and have his little ones eaten from it like hogs. Remember, he'd say who have a finished last he get a cut and hang up like a piglet and have us for Easter dinner. We eat fast then, and he'd just laugh and laugh. He used to scare me powerful, thinking of hanging up in Dad's smokehouse, all salted and ready fair master and missus to eat. I tell her that I've heard about night doctors too. I tap the leather book in my lap. I explain that I've collected stories about them from old former slaves like her, from all around the country. I ask if night doctors weren't just white men like her master, trying to scare the slaves. She coots at this. Men in sheets. Night doctors not no men in sheets. You figure in some old white man in a sheet gonna scare a big field hand like Jeremiah. Who was he? Only the biggest buck you eva seen. Strong too. One time, the overseer tie him to a tree stump. Jeremiah pulled that stump right out the ground and walk round with it dragging behind. He wasn't scared of nothing or nobody neither, except in the night doctors. Did this Jeremiah see one, I press. A night doctor. She takes another caramel, sucking for a while before answering. Jeremiah's wife, Adeline, she takes sick. Marster send out his nigger doctor, same one to look after horses and mules. But he say she burning up with the fever and gun be dead was late that same night the night doctors come. Jeremiah hear a knocking outside, and he knows nobody come calling round that time. He shout for them to leave, but night doctors don't eat what you say. They come right in under the door. Yes, under the door is what I say. They can squeeze eight bodies like a rat do, right up under your door and appear big as day. When Jeremiah see them, he try to hold on to his wife. But dem doctors just start talking day whisper talk. That's how day get on whispering right inside your head. Adeline hear dat whispering and jump out dat bed like she not sick. She start walking to dem. When Jeremiah try and stop her, she turn back to him. But not her whole body, just her neck, all twisted about like an owl. And when she open her mouth, only dat whisper talk come out. Dad just about make Jeremiah crazy. He starts to hollering and the other slaves come running. But the night doctors was gone. Take Adeline with them. My hands are shaking as I write. I've recorded many stories about night doctors, but Miss Shaw tells them with a clarity I've never before encountered. Overcome, I lean forward and spill out my own truths. I too believe these night doctors are more than folk tales, I tell her. And whoever or whatever they are, I believe they can help me in my work, help me in my great search. And what you looking for, Miss Bisset? What you thinkin' some night doctors can help you find? Hate. I tell her, I'm looking for hate. Most people would greet my words with bewilderment. They might even think I was mad. 
But Maddie Shaw only reaches for another caramel and speaks again without prodding. When Adeline was took, Jeremiah swear he gone get her back. He sneak off to see a conjuring woman what live on a near plantation. She tell him to go into the woods a ways at night and look for the dade angel oak. Dat's the way to where dem night doctors stay. He gone on do it. Traveling to the big white dissectin hall and get to fussin wit dem night doctors bout Adeline. Day don't give her, but day let him come back. When we find him, he bout half dayed and wit no eyes in his head. Yes, I say. No eyes. Wasn't nothing, dear, but bloody holes staring out at you. And he tell us what he learn. Why it is dem night doctors come. She reaches out to grab my arm. The hand that holds me is old, but the grip is tight, marked with scars and calluses, made strong by enduring hardship. It's our suffering day want. See, day ain't got no feelings where day comes from. Day empty and dried out inside. Don't know nothing about pain or misery. And ain't nobody seen more pain and suffering in these parts than us poor slaves. That's why day take jizz us. Why day leave the white folk be. That's why day take Jeremiah's eyes. Cause he done looked out on so much misery in his life. That was the bargain what won him free. She releases me then and settles back, but her eyes are as firm as her grip. If you go to see dem night doctors, day gonna set a price for you can leave. Or you don't come back. What you ready to give, Miss Devisette? That night, I walked the woods just on Durham's edges, a ghost in white. Old Maddie Shaw's instructions play in my head. Find the dead angel oak. I'd know it when I see it. But I had to want to see it, she'd said. And how I wanted that so badly. In medical school, we learned of the discarded notion of humorism, begun by those wise Hamites of Egypt, and passed down to the Greeks, Romans, and on to the Hindus in their Ayurveda medicine. It believed in the existence of bodily fluids that made up each man. Blood was the first and foremost humor of life. Yellow bile was the cause of aggression. Black bile was the source of melancholy and fling apathy. In our hubris, we've disparaged this wisdom for modernity, and it is our loss, for we are kept ignorant of the human condition. I believe there is another humor yet unaccounted for, hate. I have seen enough of its workings in this world to know that it exists. If it can be found at its source, perhaps its essence can be counteracted or drained away to ease the senseless and injurious emotion that has caused humanity such incalculable harm. I looked for it in dissecting halls and in the cold cavities of cadavers, but it remained elusive. So I took my search to living specimens. My travels have offered me unique opportunities to continue my pursuit. And these night doctors, who understand the hidden inner workings of the body, have been my inspiration. I cannot say if it is I who find the dead tree or if it finds me, but it stands out suddenly in the shadowed forest, where the hickories that surround it are tall and dark. The dead angel oak is squat and bone white. Generous branches grow out from its trunk splitting into further limbs that spill out upon the ground and reach up into the air. The skeletal remains of dead things cover the tree in a decaying moss, and as I draw near, I can see that some are fused to the pale wood, rib cages and the vertebrae of spinal columns, even teeth, all taken from more beasts than I can count. I place my hand to a hefty bow and find it solid but not hard, and warm to the touch. Opening my razor, I draw a gash across the colorless bark. It splits open and oozes blood thick as sap. The dead tree, I decide, is oddly named. I walk to the trunk, wondering fancily if the tree's many appendages might snatch me up like some horrid kraken of the deep. From my bundle of tools, I select the bone saw and set about cutting. The jagged iron teeth tear into red pulp that gives way like tough meat. By the time the hole is made wide enough, I am spattered in arboreal gore. I reach into the fleshy interior, pulling apart hardy muscle and gristle. There is soft, sucking warmth when I push myself into the gaping wound. I take a breath and thrust deeper. For a terrifying moment, there is only suffocating darkness, 
and I imagine my body becoming trapped within, digested by this monstrous tree, my bones fusing to its pallid branches and left to knock together like chimes in any errant wind. Breaking through, I tumble out onto hard stone, covered in the sweet metallic pungency of my birth blood. I am in a hall. To call it cavernous is to do an injustice. It is gargantuan, and I am but a Lilliputian in turn. Its high walls and ceilings are made of white stone that look continuous, with no bricks or seams, as if carved from one block of massive ivory. The opening I entered through is now a blistering wound, knitting back together like skin before vanishing altogether. I reach a blood-soaked palm to touch where it had been, leaving an imprint on the now unblemished stone. I turn about to look down the hall, and can now make out corridors as well. They are endless and flow on and on like a small city of stone. There is nothing to do now, I surmise, but continue my journey to seek out the masters of this nether realm. As I walk, my shoes reverberate in the silence. It strikes me that there is no sound here, but for the trail of blood left by my footsteps. All is pristine, sterile. I reach the first corridor and peer down its length. It is as swallowing and seemingly infinite as the one I now follow. Another on the opposite side is much the same. There are no windows or doors, and I am left to wonder if this hall is all there is to be found here. I am deciding my next course of action when I hear the first noise other than my own. It is a dull shuffling, like many bare feet running upon stone, and it is growing. Base instinct sends me darting into one of the corridors, wary of being seen. Back flat against the wall, I peek around the edge to find a monstrosity emerging from another passageway. I'd bite a clenched fist not to cry out. The thing before me is a horror from a fevered nightmare. It resembles a great colorless centipede, easily the width of an automobile, and longer still, with a segmented body of armor topped with a fused spinal ridge. It is so uniformly white, it blends with the stone as it pours out from the corridor winding along the ceiling on a multitude of legs, each of which ends in a long-fingered hand. Clinging to the wall, it snakes down to the closed opening where I entered. Two protracted antennae twitch as mandibles upon its eyeless head open to lap up my bloodied handprint. It stretches to the ground, half of its elongated bulk still clutching the wall while a torso of wriggling legs, fingers, and feelers scores the floor clean of the first of my bloody footprints. I turn and run, knowing now that I am being hunted. Panic grips me in my flight. I imagine this monstrosity is the guard dog of this place, or perhaps a scavenger, set to maintain its purity, and I am terrified of my fate were it to find me. I think to remove my blood-stained shoes, cursing at not having the wits to do so earlier. It is as I pause to look over my shoulder, to see if I am being pursued that something seizes me. I am pulled off my feet landing hard on my back. My head strikes the stone floor, and my world threatens to go dark in a blossom of pain. But I chase it away, forcing my mind back to coherency. I am being dragged by my legs, my body limp and arms splayed at my sides. I cry out, thinking the monstrous scavenger has captured me. But when I crane my neck to look up, I find I am held by giants. They appear to my eyes at first as impossibly tall men. Their bodies are draped in long white robes over frames that seem almost skeletal. The hands that hold me are pale with desiccated skin stretched tight over long slender fingers. I shout, demanding to be released. But when one turns back to me, I am stricken silent. There are no features on that colorless face. No eyes, nose, or even a mouth. There are just folds of wrinkled skin on an elongated head. As I stare into that blank visage, I know then that I have found the beings that I have so long sought, the bottle men and needle men of old Negro folklore who stalk the darkness and shadows, the night doctors. We stop, and I am lifted, deposited unceremoniously atop a raised block of stone. I attempt to rise, but a whisper fills my head a cacophony of voices that shatter my will. My body obeys this eldritch power, and I lay immobile as six-fingered hands reach to tear away my clothing, discarding my soiled suit and stripping me bare. 
I am unable even to blink, leaving me to stare as another block of stone descends from above. This one is lined with silver implements, the first hint of color I've seen. One looks like scissors with four serrated blades. Another is cruelly hooked like a scythe. Others are pointed, barbed, or covered in thin needles. The otherworldly lords of this realm arrange themselves about me, each taking one of the silver devices in hand. I know what they are then, the tools of the surgeon. Grasping their intent, I am fast overcome with that animal terror, the very one I have seen in the eyes of my specimens. It threatens to envelop me, drown me in its depths, but I have come too far to end things here. I grapple with the terror-stricken animal within, caging it and resting back control as a blade descends to part my flesh. Wait. I shout. I want to talk. Wait. I watch the blade move closer and wonder if my words will reach them. Were the amoeba on my picture dish to voice its lament, would I hear? Were the frog in my dissecting tray to cry out to stay my hand, would I listen? I'd remember then old Maddie Shaw's words. They would set a price. I can pay the price. I scream. The blade mercifully stops and hovers. The night doctors turn to regard each other, and the whispering begins again, filling the silence in the spaces of my mind. I do not understand, but when it stops, one of those terrible faces leans down to loom over me. The voice that comes is a whisper, alien and cold, that hammers my skull. Price. What do you know of the price? My words spill out in a rush. I know what you seek. The pain. The misery. I know it. You didn't take me like the others. I sought you out. I came here willingly. Because I know about the price. Fools come here willingly. I'm not certain if it is the same voice or another, but I give answer. Unlike you, an explorer, I search for something, something more than the misery and pain you've come to savor. Help me find it, and I will offer it to you. One of the Cyclopean heads tilt, appearing curious. Name this thing you would offer. Name this new price. Hate, I whisper. I will give you hate. The night doctors share looks and new whispers. I don't need to understand to know their meaning. It is confusion. They turn back to look down at me. You will explain. Hate. I am struck silent. How am I to describe hate to beings such as these? How do I put meaning to the insensible? I am still in my thoughts when the blade descends, cutting deep into my abdomen with a searing fire. A primal scream pours from my depths and the caged animal howls in unison, throwing itself at its bars. I watch as the glistening ropes of my intestines are pulled free. The night doctors probe its fleshy contours, heedless of my cries. A hand reaches back inside me to retrieve a pink mass I know is my stomach. It is passed around among my hosts, one of whom slits it open to spill out the putrid contents. My liver is poured over by slender fingers, investigated as one would a book. And it is only then that I understand. You will explain. Hate. They are reading me, seeking to comprehend what could not be put into words. It must have been them, I muse, who long ago visited the Babylonians, delivering the lesson of hepatoscopy, the reading of entrails, passed on to the Hittites, Etruscans, and priestesses of old Rome. With this final knowing, I surrender to the pain my shrieks coming in a holy litany. I sing to these lords of viscera. I tell them of hate, of negro bodies hung from trees like fruit, in the cooked hearts and severed fingers distributed as souvenirs, in the postcards to celebrate the bonfires made of men and women for no other crime but negritude, in the daily rituals of humiliations and oppressions that engulfs the whole land. I sing to them of the hate that consumes men's souls like a ravaging cancer, when my eyes are plucked free, leaving only tears of blood to streak my cheeks, I am still singing. It is not yet morning when I stand again before Miss Maddie Shaw. I am dressed once more in my white suit, my white shoes, my white bowler hat, and holding my white doctor's bag. She awakens at my presence, blinking up at me. You come back, she says plainly. I give a slow nod. I have been to the place where the night doctors live. 
Her eyes meet my empty, bleeding sockets. Look like it's so. Her granddaughter murmurs from a pile of blankets on the floor. I whisper a command, and she eases back into sleep. My attention returns to Miss Maddie Shaw. They have shared with me their secrets and returned me to do my work. In truth, they had done more than that. They had initiated me, chosen me as their conduit to this world, to seek out this promised feast of hate. I thank you, I say, for showing me the way. The old woman grunts, seem like you knows the way long for I tell you. I grin at this, and she flinches. When I turn to leave, she calls out a question. What you give them to learn these secrets? To let you come back? I look down, beneath the white suit, to a body now empty of organs and entrails and blood, of all that it once held. All of me, I answer. I gave everything. With those parting words, I collapse, flattening like a rat as I squeeze beneath the door of her cabin and out into the night.